This is the beginning of a hectic, interesting, exciting, wonderful sessions from ICNC to ELSEC. I really like the name from ICNC to ELSEC. I want to say a word about it before we start today, because today, today is a special day of lectures which can show all of us the directions in which we believe science should continue to pursue understanding of the brain. And I believe these lectures represent the vision of ELSEC, of ELSEC that was born from ICNC. Now, the first speaker of today is Bert Schachmann, and I wanted to have the introduction about the science, but we will save the introduction about the person, because everyone, I know that everyone knows who Bert Sackman is, and especially everybody knows the kind of friend he has been for the last, I don't know what, 20 years or so, to Jerusalem and Hebrew University Sciences. So, more than 20. Uh, well, for me, 20 is uh, end, end, the end of the world because I'm only 22. So, thank you, Bert, for being the, the chair of the steering committee of ELSEC. Thank you for all you're doing, and thank you for agreeing to give the talk today on what can we learn about brain functions from anatomical circuits reconstructions in silico. So. Good morning, Bokatov. It's a real pleasure to be here at the Mishke Notcha and Nim. I just learned today that this is the house of those who should be uh, afraid, but they are not afraid. Uh, this is based on the history of this place, and I would say this is one of, if not the nicest place you can be in, uh, in Jerusalem, hotel-wise. So thank you very much. I like to come very much. And um, visit my colleagues, um, the original title was somewhat different, and it had two words which I think should be uh, more popular in the future in brain research, and this is anatomy and numbers. So uh, I put this as sort of a provocative uh, title. What I'm really going to talk about is what can we learn about brain functions from anatomical circuit reconstructions in Siligo. Why do you want to do this? Uh, the cortical representation of a sensory uh, stimulus by different types uh, in the cortex, of different cell types in the cortex, is essential if you want to know how a sensory stimulus is transmitted or signal, uh, signaling to other parts which are not the sensory cortex and guide uh, behavior. For example, tactile guided decision making. This was the starting point of uh, this effort to do anatomy. Oh, wait a sec. Okay. So, uh, is there a point, or otherwise I'll jump, just jump around? So, uh, this is a uh, paradigm that uh, is a very simple way of uh, decision making, and um, the attractive feature of this is that it can be. Uh, made with a single whisker intact, that is, a single input channel into the sensory cortex will trigger a complete behavior. Now, this is to jump or not to jump. Now, the first thing, if you want to analyze the circuit that underlies decision-making is to identify this part of the cortex that receives the signal. Okay, thank you very much. that receives the uh, sensory signal, and this is particularly favorable in the somatosensory cortex. It uh, was discovered uh, by Wulsey and van der Loos in 1970 that a single whisker, which you would call a principal whisker, activates via the thalamus a single column in the somatosensory cortex. You see this here schematically. This is blown up. And each of these whiskers activates primarily, in the very beginning, a principal whisker. And uh, in order to um, 
describe the stimulus representation in this cortex following a single whisk of deflection. Remember, a single whisk, thank you, a single whisk of deflection can trigger a behavior, decision-making behavior. One has to record from uh, different cells. This is shown schematically here for layer four. Well, I forgot to say this uh, cortex is, has a very nice uh, vertical structure and a very nice horizontal structure, which are orthogonal to each other. So if one records from a cell, you immediately can place it into a Cartesian grid and register it into a, uh, into a uh, sort of standard Cartesian frame. Now, if one wants to describe the uh, properties of the stimulus representation, one has to record, for example, in layer uh, 4 with an uh, electrode, and one records as a consequence of a stimulus uh, deflection for example, a single action potential. Now you can characterize this response and then register it into your grid, which we'll see in a, in a few minutes. Now, the way this is done is one uh, notes by reconstruction after the uh, experiment the location of the cell and then records the number of action potentials upon repeated stimulation and this is put into a, uh, a pseudo-3D histogram. This bar then would correspond to the action potential per stimulus. Per, this is normalized per the whole layer. Um, however, and this is known also for a very long time, if one stimulates a surround whisker, that is a whisker that would project into this column, there's also a response which, which is much smaller. You can see it here as well. So what you see is a, what, what you collect is a, uh, uh, a uh, response map, call it a map, which describes the receptive field. And for all cell uh, layers, uh, for all layers, it seems that there is one principal whisker response and um, several surround whisker responses measured by count simply counting the action potentials upon stimulation of these surround whiskers. To make this a bit more visually attractive, this 3D histogram is transformed in a 2D map by uh, collapsing this uh, into densities and using a, Gaus a spatial Gaussian filter to uh, describe the response of this particular layer 4 cell this is red like this. These uh, crossover points correspond to individual whiskers or individual um, columns. For example, this point was correspond to this bar. You can see the maximum. A further simplification can be done by then calculating the profile in both directions. And this will uh, give you a measure of the width of the response. You can see that in this particular case, layer 4, there is almost only a principal whisker response. The response falls off on both sides to the surround whisker. So this is what we would call a monocolumnar, very sharp receptive field. That is, the stimulus is basically uh, represented in a single uh, in a single column, which uh, would correspond to this prin principal whisker column. If one does this in a systematic way, and this is work by uh, Christian de Koch for different layers, one gets the following picture. So we use the same um, uh, stimulus paradigm, but we are recording from different cells. <coughs> this would be uh, the ensemble of cells in layer 2, 3, in layer 4, layer 5a, layer 5b, and layer 6. And what you can see that there are very large differences in the spread of the response or the representation. So a stimulus would be represented by multi-columns up to 12 columns in layer 5, where it is restricted to a single uh, column in layer 4. These are intermediate uh, um, ways. I mean, this, is, this would be an intermediate receptive field. Also, this is a recept uh, intermediate type of receptive field. You can easily quantify this by the half width of these Gaussians, which we fitted to these um, now, uh, 
in order to make sense of what is going on, namely to ask what are the determinants of the different uh, types of receptive fields, one has to uh, reconstruct the bristle cortex in 3D. It's not, not possible to do this in 2D because, as you can see, if we look on top of the cortex, there's a wide spread up to one millimeter away from the principal column. So this is was the time when I decided to give up a slice recording and do in vivo uh, recording, following many others, for example Ehud, uh, who uh, from the very beginning had this uh, had this strategy. But I thought we have to, in order to make sense of this, we have to 3D reconstruct the repressal cortex. And th there are three steps. 3D soma distributions, 3D dendrites, and 3D axons. And as a fourth step, we use, we, we calculate the synaptic connections of the different pathways using what's called a probabilistic approach at a resolution of 30 micrometer cube voxels. This is simply a 3D version of Peter's rule, which says that within this cube, the probability of synapse occurring depends on the product of uh, um, uh, length of axon and the length of dendrite appropriately um, standardized with the number of boutons and the number of, of dendrites. All this is very, uh, uh, very extensively described in, in this paper uh, on in neural networks last, uh, last year. So first thing is to do uh, count the number of cells. This is a uh, on top view onto the vibrissal uh, cortex, uh, stained for uh, actually, uh, in this case, a gut stain, which very nicely shows the, uh, 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 the uh, arrangement. We are looking on top. These are the different rows. This would be the D row, E row, uh, e row D row, and so on. And we have now counted uh, recently now, completely autom automatically, uh, the number of cells in one of these columns in 3D. It's the second one, third one, fourth one. So this would be the arc. This would be the, the four columns uh, appropriate that represent the arc of this uh, <laughs> uh, cortex of, of this field. And this is the whole uh, the bristle cortex reconstructed for the number of cells each of these points corresponds to the location of one particular uh, cell, which we did, which we collected from one mouse, and there is, uh, um, we are just attempt, or we are just in the process of doing the second mouse and the third mouse in order to see how um, consistent this is between different mice. So, this gives us a distribution of uh, cell somata. This is shown in this slide for the C2, D2, and D3. Uh, columns. This is the bristle field again. This is a, uh, a, a you know a schematic view of these three um, columns. Red is always layer four, and these are the locations of somata in these three uh, columns. But as I said, we have this for the entire bristle cortex. We have a map, a three D map of the entire bristle cortex. One way to quantify this is, to, is by heat maps, as is shown here. It just shows the well-known uh, well fact that there is a granular layer with a very high cell density which gradually falls off in both directions and then there's a second uh, peak uh, towards the uh, uh, corpus callosum to the white matter. So this is the way we collect the data and how we quantify it by heat maps. This is all done in 3D now, so we can have a 3D uh, heat map or heat, heat volume, uh, which is very helpful if you want to study the connections between different cell types. The next step then is, can we uh, uh, put down the, the, the light, please, a bit, is uh, to expand this soma column uh, with dendrites. So what we do, and this is work over many years, 
We record from individual cells, fill them, note their location, and then register them into this, uh, into this soma column, and this gives us what we call a dendrite column. I would like to draw your attention to this particular cell type, that's a layer 5 thick tufted cell, and this is, I hope, is going to be on the front of the new uh, LSEC building. As we saw yesterday, there will be an array of, uh, of layer, five uh, layer, layer 5b thick tufted cells. However, Idan is also quite nice to put maybe those and those and a few inhibitories, I mean, just to make things a bit more interesting. Uh, <coughs> to inhibit the building. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Anyway, registering these, p uh, pasting them into our reference frame, which is based on uh, a uh, accurate description of the um, distribution of, of somata. We uh, arrive what is called a dendrite column. This is also can be read or can be transformed into a heat map of dendritic uh, densities of a particular kind. It's all published uh, recently, so I won't go into, into that in further detail. The more exciting uh, step which we did uh, over the past two years is um, this one. Each of these uh, somata with their dendrites attached also has an axon. And this axon of each cell is also registered into this reference frame of a standard column. Uh, and this is shown in blue and you can see that the notion of a single column is not really true because if you ask the question what happens to a signal that initially is restricted to a uh, single column, you will see that the next step is a uh, uh, projection of activity into the neighboring columns and a sort of a minimum requirement to reconstruct these circuits is to reconstruct at least <coughs> nine of these columns this makes a cube of about one millimeter by one millimeter by two millimeter. So Breitenberg was not all that far off, at least for the red cortex. Now, I, I would like to show you now with these anatomical data and the assumption that we make about synaptic connections, how we can analyze individual circuits. <laughs> okay, so and I will do this on a, one particular example, that is, we want to characterize the ensemble connections between layer 4 spinostelate cells and layer 2 pyramidal cells. The dendrites of these two uh, cell types are shown here in the dendrite column, Green refers to a layer 4, blue refer refers to layer, uh, layer 2, and we want to know <coughs> what is the ensemble <coughs> connectivity between layer 4 and layer 2. Not a single one, but all of them, but this means thousands. The way to do this is to uh, uh, register the axons of the layer 4 cells. This is an example of our layer 4 cells that have been registered into this standard column and they will make contact with a layer 2-3 with the uh, uh, dendrites of, layer two th of a layer 2-3 cell. Now, since all this is uh, in the memory of a computer, it's all registered, using Peter's rule in 3D we can now calculate the number of synapses, which are shown in green, established by layer 4 in l on a single layer 2 cell. And this is what you see here. This is the distribution of calculated synaptic connections between the ensemble of layer 4 cells and a single layer 2, 3 cell. From the top, you also can see that there is a, first of all, you see there is a preference to, on the basal dendrites. And you also can see that in this particular case, there's a preference towards the uh, board of the column. We also uh, calculated the distribution of synapses 
that are formed by layer 4 cells that are located in, this, uh, in the adjacent column. And you can see, as expected, there's a much lower density of synapses. And, as you also can see, there is a preference on this particular uh, <coughs> neuron towards the border of the column. So this would be uh, our way how we calculate synaptic connectivity. We can quantify it then by calculating the number of synapses per cell established by the ensemble of layer 4 cells. And we arrive for this particular pathway, thir about uh, 1,300 synapses per cell, I mean anatomical synapses, and about 70 from the uh, surround column. So this particular cell, on, aver or this, on average, each of the layer 2 uh, pyramids receives 1,300 contacts from layer 4 in the, pr in the principal whisker column and 60 from the adjacent surround whisker column. Now these are average values. We have done this uh, since we have the distribution of somata. We have this for, e for, for very specific neighborhood relations and it's by no means so that uh, the whistle the cortex is homogeneous. One has to be really careful in selecting the neighbors in, uh, if one derives these numbers. These are, these are a number of boutons? Uh, these are the calculated number of synapses using the b <coughs> a, a bouton distribution of one, I think one per square m uh, per micrometer, and a de two per, per, per micrometer, and two, um, two um, uh, spines per micrometer. Uh, but it's not the number of presynaptic sources. No, no, wait a sec, just to be clear. We uh, register this, do a 3D Peters rule, then calculate the number of putative synapses that will be formed based on Peters rule, normalized to the density of, synap uh, of butons and dendrites. So this is, n uh, this is uh, uh, the number of butons that have found a spine. Okay? Is this clear? Sorry, I mean. The question was how many boutons on average per layer 4 cell? Um, I can look this up. I mean, this. Uh, uh, four or one? <coughs> you mean one uh, from a single, single cell? cell. A single layer 4 cell, how many boutons it has on a single layer 4 cell? Ah, okay. So that's very low. It's in the order of two to three. Okay? So this we have this. Uh, this gives us a, uh, let's say, structural connect, uh, connectivity probability and that's always between two and five for all our connect or for for these connections uh, but we are really interested in the ensemble behavior we want to know let's say all of layer four is active how will this affect a single uh, a, sing a single cell in layer two <coughs> now this shows uh, the distribution of synapses of, again, I have to say this, calculated synapses for uh, boutons arising from the principal whisker uh, column and from the surround whisker column. You can see, first of all, the huge difference, but on average, they are located not very far apart. It seems that the surround maximum is slightly uh, further outside from or away from the uh, soma. So this is our way to calculate synapse distribution <coughs> by calculating the mean distance, the mean path length, not this, uh, path length uh, from the soma. So this is our quantification of synapse locations. Now, uh, doing this in a systematic way for all the connections, if we are not quite through, uh, we end up with what, what is called a uh, connection strength matrix for three columns. This is shown here for three columns which are sitting, which are located next to each other. And you, by looking at, let's say, C1 to C2, obviously within, within a, a, the C2 uh, <coughs> column, they are the strongest connections. There are, however, a, a connections between C1 and C, C2 and C3 and C2. Now, this just gives you an impression of the fact that the strongest anatomical connections are, as expected, within a, uh, within the column, but there is uh, connections between the principal column and the uh, surround columns. 
in almost every column we have been looking at, this will be C2, C2, C3, C3, C4, C1. Uh, you have only this data because it's uh, at the border. Now, I want to briefly summarize it, uh, this. The re receptive uh, field sizes are layer and cell type specific, small monocolumn in layer 4, and large multicolumn in layer 5b. <laughs> A cube of cortex, uh, which, would, uh, which had to be reconstructed, has a dimension of 1 by 1 by 2 millimeter and contains about 200,000 uh, neurons. <coughs> and the, uh, um, the connection matrix in silico, as we call, call this, because we calculate the synapses in silico, uh, assuming probabilistic synapse densities at a resolution of 30 micrometer voxels, yields first estimates of the connectivity between cortical cell ensembles at the synapse level. Now, and this is why I'm here, because these matrices get so large that we can't deal with them anymore and we need some uh, expert support or collaborations, and I very much hope that we can establish a collaboration within the framework of the Max Planck Hebrew University Center. Now, what I have shown you uh, is I want now want, want to focus on the question: Can we? Uh, oh yeah, can oh no. Wait a second, it's half past. Yeah, can we? Uh, calculate or understand the shape of synaptic uh, of receptive fields in any particular layer by using these uh, numbers, the connection matrix, and be able to um, rationalize the connections between different cell types. In order to do so, one has to first <laughs> recognize that each column or each cell has two types of maps. I was telling you about the output map, that is we record the number of action potentials following a whisker deflection, but at the same time you want to record also the EPSPs, or you first want to record the EPSPs and the action potential, and this is what's called an input map. So each uh, cell or each layer has both an input map and an output map. This simply stems from the fact that not every EPSP triggers an action potential. And I would like to focus now on a particular question that has intrigued me for many, many years. Uh, th this is, uh, can we understand the receptive field of layer 2, 3 neurons following a single whisker uh, deflection? And I will show you this only for the input map because the input map is a direct reflection of the synaptic connectivity. For the output map, you have to take into account a uh, spike generating mechanism and then the, the uh, uh, difference between different cell types is very much blurred because every cell type has a different spike generating mechanism. So what do I mean by that? We are looking at layer 2, 3 input map and we are looking at layer 4 the output map. What you can see is that the first uh, EPSPs are generated within 15 milliseconds, almost coincidence with the first action potentials of layer 4. I just want to be clear. So we are looking at the EPSP map <coughs> of a layer 2-3 cell and compare it with the output map of layer 4 because layer 4 directly projects into layer 2-3. And what you can see quite clearly is that the, in layer 2, 3, the PSP map keeps increasing with time, whereas in layer 4, the, uh, the, the activity decreases in after 80 milliseconds, there's ba barely any uh, activity. So clearly, there's a huge difference between the input uh, into the uh, uh, layer 2, 3 cell and what is coming out of layer 4, meaning that it can't be alone layer 4 that drives layer 2, 3 because of this time res uh, uh, relation, it, may, uh, it can account for the initial EPSP in the principal whisker and its, uh, uh, and its uh, uh, area, but it can't account for this later. Later means 40 to 80 milliseconds, well within uh, the time frame that is relevant for uh, sensory uh, decision making. Now, 
what we skip, and I will come to this at, at, the, at the end, is how the layer 2.3 input map is transferred into a, a P output map. So you have here the sequence of inputs into layer 2.3, that's the effect in layer 2.3, and this is what layer 2.3 makes out of this input. You can see quite clearly that the maps, the exponential maps, are much narrower uh, than the PSP maps. And you also can see that uh, there is no direct correlation between the size or the intensity of the PSP map and, uh, and the output from layer 2.3. But I will restrict now the analysis to understanding quantitatively the shape uh, of layer 2.3 <coughs> input maps. The hypothesis is that it's the density of projecting axons in layer 2 columns that determines the size of the layer, uh, layer 2 PSP map. So what we think is that somehow this reflects the collective input not only from layer 4 but from other layers. Um, and we uh, hypothesize that this is a direct reflection of the density of um, axons arising from projecting neurons. So this would be uh, axons projecting into the principal whisker column. These would be uh, projecting into surround whisker or coming from the surround whisker. And the same is true for this and for this. So um, to do so, we first <coughs> compared the layer 4 PSP map with the projecting layer, layer 4 you just saw, slender tufted gives us a hint that maybe these later EPSPs, later meaning 40 milliseconds, are arising from layer 5A action potentials and uh, especially these very late ones are layer 5A action potentials. Also it seems that the layer 5b action potentials that project directly into layer 2.3 are accounting for the large for the large size of these EPSPs. You can see that this comprises almost nine, uh, nine uh, columns, very similar to or comparable to what we see here and here. Now, what to our, what's, what's happening to our hypothesis? The, this is a, a view on top of layer 2. These are the barrels, <coughs> outlines, and I have, uh, I have circled the principal column, and that's the distribution of axons uh, projecting into layer 2. And you can see the axons are very much restricted to the principal uh, column, principal whisker column. The situation is very different for the layer 5, slender tufted pyramids, here there is extensive projection from layer 5 into layer 2 that comprises the first ring of surround whistles and even the second. Situation in layer 5 uh, thick tuft is again different. The projections into layer 2 are more or less restricted to um, a single column, making layer 5 slender tufted A candidate that is responsible for the spread of action potentials or of, of uh, synaptic potentials into the surround whisker. This is the shape of uh, input maps we see after 40 milliseconds, 40 to 100 milliseconds. Now, uh, this is again quantified. So we look at the number of synapses per cell uh, made by, layer f by the ensemble of layer 4 neurons. You saw this before. Uh, 1370 for layer 5a the situation is uh, very different we have about 700 uh, from the principal <coughs> layer into the principal column and 250 into the surround uh, column and another case is layer uh, is layer 5 has a rather sparse uh, projection into layer 2 and an even sparser projection into the surround uh, whiskers, uh, surround columns. So this means or suggests that it is the combination of layer 4 uh, inputs and layer 5a inputs 
that based on the anatomy are responsible for the spread of uh, uh, EPSPs in uh, layer two. Simply on anatomical grounds, uh, we would expect that the initial part of the response is mediated by layer four. So this would be the initial part. Wait a sec. So this would be the initial part. Then as time proceeds, we have a spread into the uh, adjacent columns of layer five. However, this is not true. Um, what you saw in these uh, maps, output maps from the different layer where they were normalized to the peak in order to make this difference in shapes visible. If we take into account the number of cells in a particular layer and normalize it to the total output, we find that the action potentials in layer two, three are negligible, so are the action potentials in layer five. So layer five cannot be responsible for the spread of uh, excitation within layer two also, the anatomical determinants are there, but since there is no action potentials, it will not activate layer 2, 3. What else? And this is shown here, uh, trying to uh, show you what I just said. That's the PSP input map now uh, taken at 80 milli or 60 milliseconds. This is the spread of axon from layer 4, the spread of axon from layer 5A and the spread of axon from layer 5b. As I just said, this would be a perfect candidate to, to be uh, responsible for this spread. However, if there are no action potentials, there is no input. So layer 5 being almost silent in the anesthetite state is not responsible for this, uh, for this um, uh, spread of excitation in layer 2, 3. We have to find another solution. Now, um, the only candidate then is uh, layer 5b, are the layer 5b axons. If you look at the uh, at reconstruction of layer 5b axon within a, uh, now we are looking from the side, you can see that the uh, projections between layer 5b and, and layer 2 are very, very sparse and there is basically no or very little spread of the uh, axons into the adjacent layer. So, what can we do? The uh, hypothesis is that upon a single whisker deflection, not only the principal whisker column is turned on, but also the surround whisker columns are turned on. So this will give you a, a broad spread of activity in layer two, assuming <laughs> that these cells are, upon a single whisker deflection, almost simultaneously active. So, to show this in a, a more schematic form, what we assume is that upon a principal uh, column um, deflection, there is activity driving layer two, but for reasons which we don't know, uh, we'll show some hypotheses. Also, if a surround whisker column is turned on, this will project into this particular, uh, into this particular column. The simplest assumption is that these cells are very strongly coupled. You turn on one, uh, you, you wiggle one whisker, and the whole of layer five is active. So this would be one way uh, to assume that is the coupling of layer five B cells, which for each column has a very sparse projection, but it might be able to spread the activity due to the fact that these are simultaneously active. And this is what we measure. Uh, just to, to uh, uh, sh drive this point, uh, show this a bit more visually. We have used uh, Amiram and Hildesheim's dye <coughs> and looked at the spread of activity in layer two following a single whisker deflection. And this is what we see. Uh, after 10, after 16 milliseconds, the activity, and I have to say, this dye reports predominantly PSPs, that is synaptic input. After 16 milliseconds, it's restricted to a principal whisker column. 
Um, then after, 20, uh, after, after 26 it spreads and after 50 it comprises the first and the second ring of uh, uh, activity. Now, when we did these experiments, our interpretation was that this initial activity generates action potentials and these action potentials then in turn activate the surround columns. Looking at the response magnitude, this is not not possible. Rather, we think, or what I think now is, that this initial part of the of the response is due to layer four input, and this is mostly layer five B input at later uh, at, la uh, at later stages, because of this uh, uh, mechanism which I just showed you. <coughs> so the idea would be a principal viscous deflection activates both layer four and layer and layer five B. Both of them project into layer two as the initial part. At later part, uh, the co-activated layer five B cells, <coughs> which are coupled, project into the principal whisk, and this is why we see the spread, or why we see multicolumnar receptive fields, or the spread. So because of the coupling of these layer five B cells, there is a wave of excitation <coughs> sweeping across layer 2, which is reflecting basically the activity of layer 5a, uh, layer 5b. Now this hypothesis receives some support, or strong support, from experiments done in Arthur Connors lab together with uh, Susanna Varga and uh, Hong Bo, uh, Jia, where we looked at the directly at the input, at the dendritic input of individual cells located in the principal whisker column. So we are wiggling, uh, let's say this one, and activate the principal whisker. We are all, all, there's a recording also done for filling the cell. And what we see is, as expected, that even if you go to this next, over next neighbor, um, there is an activation of this particular column. If you record in a uh, cell that is located in the principal whisker, so <coughs> there is activation of uh, e by, by E2 of, of C2. And we can look at the input, or they can look at the input at spine resolution in this particular cell. So this shows the experiment again. In the principal viscous column, uh, electrode is used to fill the cell, and we are systematically uh, changing or wiggling the principal whisker and the surround whisker, and note down the input pattern of uh, active spines. And what you see is, this is from an experiment. Hmm. Now watch what's happening here, the whisker is wiggling. No, here the whisker is wiggled, here the whisker is wiggled, and this is the, uh, the, the uh, deflection. This is a pipette, and this is a dendrite, which is in uh, one focal plane, which, because we have, they have to uh, uh, image rather fast. So this is the filling pipette, and these are dendrites uh, of this particular cell upon whisker deflection. Uh, that's good. Oh yeah. Okay. And again. So, what you see is, first of all, there's a distributed input. There is no such thing as a clustering, uh, as it has been inferred. On younger animals, there's no clustering of uh, uh, synapses, of active synapses. And what is more interesting is that the uh, pattern evoked by the principal whisker and by the surround whisker, remember this is two columns far away, is rather similar. So if you look at the density or the number of, of uh, hotspots that are activated by a principal whisker and by a surround whisker, they are almost uh, identical. This is a quanti quantified, uh, uh, this quantifies it and what we observed is that each one of these uh, hotspots is either 
principal viscous specific or shared viscous specific or the majority uh, of a surround viscous specific or shared. Shared means you can activate this spot both by principal visca and by surround visca. This means there is no specific or very, very little specificity at the level of uh, single spines in the dendrites of a layer to three cells. This is quantified. Oh, money, uh, wait a sec. So that's uh, on the lower part you see the recording, EPSP recording, and here you see the uh, what we call hotspots. In the meantime, they have managed or we have managed to show that these hotspots correspond to single spines, and the quantification of more than a thousand of uh, spine active spines is shown here. And I said the major point is that the principal visca. Uh, 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 hotspots that are specific for the principal whisker are higher than hotspots specific for the surround whisker, but the majority of spines is what we call shared, meaning they can be activated both by the principal whisker and by the surround whisker. Now, how can this be? Oh, this is just a quantification. <coughs> Looking at the probabilities, there are the similar you can see between the unique spines for principal viscous stimulation. The unique spines to surround viscous stimulation are obviously, as you saw in the previous slide, are very small. Their distribution of probability is, let's say, not statistically different as far as we can tell from these uh, uh, limited uh, uh, data. Now, what is happening is layer two cell spines, which we uh, activate by jiggling or deflecting the principal whisker can be activated by layer 4 or by a, a surround whisker which uh, layer 4 projecting to this but the majority of what we call s s uh, shared spines is due to the fact that layer 5 B cells activate each other they are almost simultaneously act active so a active spine can be turned on by jiggling this whisker or by this whisker. Given the time resolution of about <coughs> 200 milliseconds, we cannot, uh, we have been trying to look at the time resolution, but the major point is that a spine that is observed in this part can be either uh, activated by the principal whisker or by the surround uh, whisker. So this is more or less what we expect on the basis of the previous analysis of what determines the uh, spread of activity in layer 2 3. This is a high percentage of uh, shared spines. In fact, it's more than 50% of the uh, spines in layer 2 3 upon a viscous stimulation is shared. It can be activated by both. And due to the anatomy, to the restricted anatomy of layer 4, the only way this can be done is by uh, uh, inferring this mechanism on layer 5 B cells. I've done also some quantification of this, and this is, don't take this too serious, it just uh, shows that we are in the right ballpark, I would say. I've calculated the number of uh, uh, specific spines, the number of shared spines, and the number of uh, specific surround uh, viscous spines, assuming or taking our anatomical uh, connection matrix. As a uh, uh, input, we take the uh, input map of layer 5. You can see that, that uh, in layer 5, upon a single whisker, almost nine different or more than nine are turned on. And the only assumption I made is a PR per bouton of 0.6, which is a garden, uh, which is a sort of a, a, a mean value of what we, okay, I'm done in a few minutes. Um, is a sort of a mean value you see in many uh, cortical cortical uh, circuits. Now, if we calculate, or if I calculate the number of specific inputs, most of the specific inputs are from layer four. Shared are uh, substantially less, and specific are very small. 
the situation is very different. The specific inputs are much smaller for the layer 5 to layer 2 connections and there are no specific but there is a large majority of, uh, of uh, um, shared inputs. Now, <coughs> taking into account input from layer 2, 3, layer 4, layer 5a and layer 5b, we arrive at figures which are comparable, not exactly, <coughs> it would be too surprising, comparable to what we see experimentally. The number of uh, specific of, of a, a principal whisker turned on by, by, by principal uh, by uh, specific spines, shared spines, and surround whisker spines gives a total of 112. The air of active spines, if they were all active, and on average this would uh, inf we would infer a active spine spacing of 10 micrometer, which is very similar to what we see. Not at the same time. I just have to tell you this is these numbers are average numbers from many many experiments. On each particular experiment, only a fraction of these, cells, uh, these spines will be turned on. The numbers have, have been uh, calculated by doing many experiments, always counting the number of spines that are turned on. So this is an estimate of the activatable spines, not the spines that are active upon a single whisker deflection. But if you just do the same experiment, count the number of uh, spines that turn up, up at uh, one time over another, you uh, uh, end up with 112, uh, uh, about a thousand potentially active spines. And this would uh, correspond to 10 micrometer, uh, 10 micrometer. So, summary, the multicolumnar uh, PSP representation is determined by the boutons of coupled layer 5 C cells in multiple adjacent columns. The salt and pepper distribution of synaptic representation of a whisker deflection reflects specific inputs by layer 4 and shared inputs of multiple whisker from layer 5, predominantly layer 5 uh, uh, thick tufted boutons. The input via layer 5 slender tufted boutons is anatomically the most dense, <coughs> but in the anestite cortex contributes little to stimulus representation in layer 2 in layer 2 due to the low action potential activity. Now, as Ehud and others have shown, this is very different in the awake animal. So, in the awake animal, we expect uh, a much stronger contribution of layer 5a, and if at some t time it's uh, possible uh, to do these experiments in the awake uh, animal, then we would get a very different uh, pattern of activation of layer 2, 3 uh, cells due to the fact that there is a high density of projection from layer 5 but a very low uh, uh, action potential activity. Now all this work was done in Jupiter. Who knows who is Jupiter? Where is Jupiter? Who? Good, yes. You know where Jupiter is? No. Jupiter is in Florida. And I spent three years illuminating brain circuits in Jupiter's sun. And you can see the uh, building where all this was done. We rented this from the Florida Atlantic uh, University. But, and this is an inference, because we were so successful, uh, the president, Peter Cruz, gave us a new institute. I mean, this is my interpretation. And uh, now we are located in this ver very lavish building. I don't know whether the sign is going to be better than in the uh, old buildings which we rented. But nevertheless, I just w would like to take this to mention the mo uh, most important collaborators is Marcel Oberländer, Hannes Sebastian Meyer, Robert Egger, who uh, uh, this paper is coming out soon. It's a 3D reconstruction of the whole mouse brain with, uh, uh, with Soma location, Marlene Arts, Tatjana Klele, Mike Hemberger. We collaborated with Christian de Kock and Simbo Bodewins, with Randy Bruno <coughs> from <coughs> Columbia, the uh, Vince Derken from the Zuse Institute, and last not least, Moritz Helmstetter, who was um, 
interested enough to take this all to the EM level. So in a few years' time, we won't have to use um, uh, Peter's principles, but we will we will probably have at the, at the EM uh, have this connection at EM resolution. I returned to Munich after we found or hired a CEO, it's David Fitzpatrick. Many of you will know David. He is now the CEO. I have to learn what this is. It means sent, uh, Chief, Chief exec Executive exec Officer. Exec officer. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this is a title. I, I, I didn't know that a university can give, give such titles, but he's also a scientific director, fortunately. And uh, uh, we have hired Ryohei Yasuda, also from Duke. He's a second director, and we are looking for a third director in 2014. If some of uh, you are very interested in cortical circuits, please pay a, a visit to Florida Atlantic and visit David and uh, Ryohei. I keep a guest lab, but I, my sort of mission is finished, and I wish David and, and Ryohei uh, uh, good, good luck. Well, this is not the end, because this is why I'm here. We have to uh, do the transformation of the PSP map into an action potential map. This requires taking into account the layer 4 dendritic synapse locations, and we use a multi-compartment model of layer 2 cells uh, and large-scale stimulation. This has been sort of pioneered by Idan in a paper with Sarid and by Lang who did the large-scale uh, simulations, and I hope um, the talk was sufficiently interesting for the uh, ICNC to get interested in reconstructing a piece of cortex at uh, this resolution. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bert. Yeah. Quick yes. I saw palm trees, palm trees on your institute. Where are the dendrites? Uh, well, these are Floridian palm trees, <laughs> and they don't have dendrites, as far as I can tell. <laughs> but then my question was and they, they, we are all bought, you know. I mean, this is maybe, I shouldn't tell this, but a fair amount of money on this building was spent to surround it by a wood of palm trees. But they are not natural. They all come. They are about a thousand dollars per piece. So uh, <laughs> maybe you should think about this. <laughs> okay. So, but the two quick questions. One, the thalamic input was not mentioned. I, I guess Layer two three has very. You can. You can. Um, uh, it, it's not relevant for spreading. That there is thalamic input. This will be published. But I was mostly concerned about the mechanism that underlies the spread of activity in layer two. And there, the thalamic input is uh, not contributing anything, just based on the sparse and localized innovation. And the, and the other good question, so within this 80 milliseconds of spread, I'm sure some inhibition comes in as well. Yes. Yeah, but this is not yet taken into account. Uh, I think the inhibition is more important for figuring out how the PSP map is transformed into an action potential map. Uh, since um, there are, we have, we have a, as I say, a complete map of inhibitory neurons, also dual recordings. The question is uh, from inhibitories, and my, let's say, hypothesis is they are more important for generating the PSP, ma the action potential map. Um, one intriguing possibility is that uh, when you move from an anesthetized to awake, uh, what actually will cause the activity layer 5a to have taken effect is the, is the whisking. So Absolutely. Perhaps, perhaps artificial whisking in an anesthetized rat would also activate layer 5a on this speculation. Well, I just uh, got uh, the recipe by um, David Kleinfeld how to make them whisk in the anesthetized state. You know, you want to record intracellularly. Uh, and this is very difficult in, in the awake animal. We have tried, but the best you can do is yuxtasonal recording, but there is now a way to, to use uh, uh, the central pattern generator and then work in the head fixed animal with net, well, induced whisking. That's exactly what we do. We also have a paper in PNAS where we show that 
recording from identified layer 5A cell in the whisking animal is indeed increased or let's say shifted in its pattern when, when the uh, animal is whisking. So you're perfectly right, layer 5A is something that is important for the awake and the anesthetite. Thank God it's not playing a big role. I've been uh, there. Let, uh, this is what we thought initially, but looking at the distribution of <laughs> axons, it barely crosses one and a half, uh, one and a half um, barrels or columns, and the activity is so low that it can't have no an way, effect. It, no yes, but. We have done recordings in layer 2 3 in the awake, and this is spontaneous activity, and it's undistinguishable. So we, we anesthetize, not whisker induced, but the normal ongoing activity barely change, well, doesn't change significantly between repeated changes between anesthetized uh, and awake animal. So that's what I thought as well. As soon as layer 2 3 becomes more active, then an additional mechanism for spreading of activity is, is turning in. But so far, we have no evidence for this. Thank you very much, Bert. Thank you very much. The <laughs> most illuminating lecture on local cortical circuits, which is at the heart of our interest here at ESC. And now, I want to invite another good friend who has many students from our center. And I have a surprise for you, dear friend. You will be introduced by one of them. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, you want this? Let me set up the... So uh, I'm very honored to introduce uh, the next speaker, one of my two advisors, wonderful advisors, Dari Abbott. Uh, I want to tell you a very quick story of uh, before I even came to Columbia, I, met a, I sent an email with a short list of things that were needed to be done or were already done in order for me to come. And by the end of the list, I added the goal. What my other advisor, Yossi, keeps telling me to do, solve the brain. And Larry's <laughs> response was, six months should be plenty of time for that. I managed to Columbia, it's been more than six months. I don't know about that, but we definitely kept the spirit that was in this email correspondence. Um, I also want to tell you that I know he's a true theoretician because he told about himself that data don't make him cry, but formula do. <laughs> and uh, last and more serious note, I think that you can see how truly he shaped the field of computational neuroscience because you can see his personality within the field. Um, his strive for simplicity, looking for basic um, principles, and also recently embracing and accepting the variance within the collective of how important it is for the ability of the collective. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this was an large film. I think it's Thank you very much, Marav. OK. Uh, thank you, Marav. I didn't totally listen to you because I was trying to get this going, but I assume you said nice yeah. things, so thank you. Uh, and very, I, I thank you for not giving my title because my title is irrelevant. Uh, it's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and I think as I go along, it'll be apparent why I, I chose to talk about something else, very preliminary, part of it is very preliminary, but um, I think it suits the occasion. So uh, let me start by, by saying a little bit what I would have said if I had been true to my title. Um, I would have done a pretty standard analysis of some data from, from motor cortex, uh, starting with spike trains like this, like uh, everybody does. Um, and then moving over and extracting firing rates from those spike trains, and then doing some manipulations on the, the firing rates. I would have done principal component analysis and talked about its significance. You know, I would, that's what, that, that path. Um, and of course, this is a very standard path. I think almost every talk that, that presented data on spike neurons uh, at least made this change. And I think we forget sometimes what, a, what an abstract leap this is. Uh, theorists are often uh, accused of being too abstract, you know, making models that are so abstract they have nothing to do with the, uh, the biology. Uh, but we can accuse the experimentalists of that too. You know, a, a firing rate, so, so this stuff here, this is real, right? Neurons really do make spikes, and we know how they make spikes in, in great detail. 
But when you go over to these derived things, there's really nothing, no, no experimentalist can directly measure a firing rate. It's an inferred quantity, an abstract quantity. Uh, and of course, you can go there to even more abstract quantities. And so, you know, we're used, so used to firing rates, we don't think about this a whole lot. Um, but in fact, you can see that the, a little bit the mess that this creates in the literature. Namely, firing rates are not really uniquely defined, so people don't agree on them. Um, and, and, you know, they don't have a direct biophysical reality. You cannot stick any kind of probe in the brain and get this curve out of that probe. Um, and so that bugs me. I don't know if it bugs uh, my experimental colleagues, but it bugs me a lot. And so my talk is in, in part about that and really asking the question, what are the biophysical correlates of these variables by which we analyze the system? Very rarely do we analyze the system directly in terms of the spikes. Let me stress that I'm not talking about spike timing and firing rates and all this stuff. That's not the issue. I, I'm a firm believer that this is the right way to go. I'm not criticizing this form analysis. Um, I'm just reacting to the queasiness of what are we talking about when we do this form of analysis. So that, that's the overriding question for everybody. Now, this duality of, of, uh, of thinking about uh, neural systems, of course, feeds over into the theoretical community where we really work with two kinds of models. We work with models like this, in which we have a network, it makes spikes, it has either very detailed biophysics or at least a crude enough biophysics to, to generate spikes, um, and, and we do this. But often, I would say, often maybe in the majority of cases, we work on more abstract models, just like the experimentalists work on more abstract quantities, um, which are models where directly firing rates are generated. There are no spikes. Instead, a unit over here, its output is 12 hertz, not, at, strictly speaking, 12 spikes in one second. Uh, and we do it for exactly the same reasons the experimentalists do it, that the variables that you can work on over here are continuous variables, uh, firing rates if you want. Uh, there's a variable from which the firing rates are derived in, this, in these models, and it's important to remember it. I'm going to call it X throughout the talk. Uh, these are continuous variables. You can do the standard analysis methods that uh, you know, have been developed over hundreds of years uh, on this, and, and this is much more problematic. Uh, there's really no metric for spikes. Many, many, for many reasons you do this. But, but we also have the queasiness of exactly how do you go be back and forth between these quantities. So this is a shared issue that I, I want to address. Um, okay, so let me try to be more specific about two components in my talk. If you talk about responses, and again, I'm flipping a little bit to the experimental side for a moment. Um, I think that, that most uh, experimentalists working on the sensory, let's say sensory cortex, uh, would say, well, there's a sensory driven component. That's often what's being studied. But in addition, there's other stuff. And, and often that's represented as Poisson spiking. So of course, the spikes are not repeated identically over different trials. And, and the statistics is often approximately Poisson. And in addition, you have rate fluctuations. Uh, Mickey Goldberg talked about this the other day and, and actually seeing a behavioral correlate of, of these baseline uh, rate levels. Uh, so there, there are two kinds of fluctuations. Often uh, people are mostly interested in this, but uh, these two are often uh, put together in what's called a doubly stochastic model. In other words, you take the sensory driven component, you add a, a random fluctuation for that trial of the firing rates, and then you, you put on top of them random plus on spikes. And again, let me just stress this, that again, there's no biophysics here. There are, there are not, nobody believes there are random number generators in the brain that generate these kinds of things. So, so this is a useful but not particular biophysical thing. Now, uh, I think theorists, and, and in particular, I'm very interested in this stuff, although you know, this is what we mostly talk about in neuroscience because this stuff is intrinsic to the, to the brain. This is driven from the outside world, but this stuff just gets generated. And, and you know, this doubly stochastic model is a pathetic model of that. This is, is not what's going on. I don't think anybody believes uh, that, that, that that's what's happening. Now, we have pretty good models of this kind of thing. I would say, uh, we can't, you know, Poisson, you might say, is a model, but it, it's far from a biophysical model. It's a dice rolling model. But we have models in which, which I'll talk about, uh, there's chaotic spiking. 
And that chaotic spiking kind of kind of looks Poisson. So it's a way of deterministically, without a random number generator, uh, producing the kind of spike variations that we actually see in the data. Now, the, and, and there's really good, this has good biophysics behind it. We, we believe it's due to, to a balance of excitation inhibition. This, this is really uh, pretty solid stuff, I think. We also have uh, models in which chaotic rate fluctuations are produced, something like this. Again, they're not produced uh, by a stochastic process. Uh, and, and these models are very beautiful, but they suffer from the same problem that I've been trying to emphasize, that we really don't know what these firing rate models are all about. But you might ask, you know, could we make kind of a doubly stochastic model uh, that would, would, a doubly chaotic model, I'm sorry, that would reproduce this doubly stochastic process that fits the data nicely but is not biophysically realistic. And, and really the, the problem here is again one that these models and these models really live in these different spaces the biophysical space and the more abstract space. So, so this problem arises there. And the, the work I'll talk about here was done with Mark Churchland and a graduate student, Brian De Pasquale. Um, okay, now let me go back to this for a second. The, this stuff occurs on, on two different time scales, right? This is fast noise, if you want to call it noise, and this is kind of more slow noise. But of course, those aren't all the time scales that, that happen in, in neuroscience. Um, so, you know, we have chaotic rate models, that model I've talked about, rate fluctuations, but generally the sort of second-to-second -second dynamics uh, that we, we, uh, we have in, in making decisions, in reaching my arm, in, in, you know, kind of everyday life, I think our leading models of that are these uh, rate models, and, and, and they maybe start off as chaotic rate models. But of course, that's not the whole story. We also have uh, more slow dynamics. For example, I know that for the next you know, 45 minutes, I'm up here talking, uh, and uh, I, I, appropriately, I, I assume I will behave appropriately. Um, and, and presumably, there's some fixed uh, notion in my head that that's what I'm doing. And, and we have also very nice models, uh, fixed point models, which people use for memory, for decision making, for longer term sort of uh, process. And the second part at the end of my talk uh, is talking about sort of trying to unify these views, which is now going not, we have the fast dynamics, which is the spiking, the intermediate time scale, which are these chaotic rate models, and then the really long time scale are these fixed point models, trying to put that together. And, and that's the work of Merav, who, who introduced me, uh, that, that I'll talk about. Okay, now I, th I've put out these buzzwords, chaotic spiking networks, chaotic rate models, fixed point models. Um, and th that's really why this talk, I think, is appropriate to the occasion, because these are really, it's not too much of an approximation to say the product of Hebrew University, really the product of these three phases. I, I sort of think we celebrate three phases, the pre-ICNC phase, the ICNC phase, and the LSEC phase. Um, and because of the nature of my talk, I mean, I would love to be able to do credit to the, the whole body of work that's come out of here and all the many wonderful researchers, but I can't. It's a kind of a specialized talk. Um, and so uh, I'd like to say that, that, that this work, uh, you'll see several names you recognize once I put up the references, but it really comes from a subset of LSEC. Um, and uh, it's an institute that, that you probably haven't heard of, but you know, you have many acronyms here, ICNC, LSEC. I think you will have heard of the acronym of this institute. This institute is the Hebrew Academy, Academic Institute for the Mind. Um, and uh, if you see that the, the product of this institute uh, is well represented in, in these models. But not only, Danny Amit had an important role, here's Mickey London you'll recognize, uh, Hannah Goodfriend, uh, and, and a whole lot of students and postdocs and things like that. Uh, okay, so, so really these are things that were developed over many, many years by the Hebrew Ac Academic Institute, as I say, but um, th they're still very much alive. I think that's the point of my talk, and I'd like to play with them a little bit in, in order to address these questions. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to start with a spiking network. So, Think of this as a fairly biophysically realistic network. It's going to be simplified, but I don't think you should worry too much about the fact that I've simplified it. I, I could make better models here, or we could make better models here. So this is something like 1,000 or 5,000 integrating fire neurons. Very simple neurons, but the key is that they make spikes. And, and, and if they made spikes by a more biophysical process, I don't think anything I, I say uh, today would be changed. 
Okay, now at the beginning, they just have random connectivity. So these are one of these, going to be the, one of these chaotic spiking models. In other words, these connections and their strengths are just chosen randomly. We're, the network isn't really meant to do anything yet. Uh, and when you do that, uh, this is one of the, the discoveries that I, that I cited just before, um, what you get is, is this Poisson-like spiking. It's really chaotic, not, not Poisson, but here you can see a bunch of spikes being generated by neurons, over, these model neurons over 10 seconds. Here you can see a voltage trace from one of these neurons. You see the fluctuations caused by this very irregular spiking in the presynaptic neurons, and then occasionally this guy fires some spikes in a very irregular pattern. Okay, so this is not a bad model of a neural circuit doing nothing. Okay, now I'm going to do an analysis of this, even though it's kind of a stupid analysis, because I want to compare it with, with things I'm going to do later on in the talk. So I could extract firing rates from this stuff in the, in the same way everybody does. Maybe I would, I would average over trials and, and, and filter these things. Or there's a number of ways to do this. I would extract firing rates, and I could do an analysis of those firing rates. And as I say, I'm going to do this later where you get more interesting results. But uh, for example, if I look at the percent variances in a principal component analysis of those firing rates, uh, what I find is nothing, essentially. All the principal components are roughly the same which just means that these principal components, and here are a few of them, are really just noise that, that is equal for all neurons in all directions. You know, it's just junk. In other words, in these models, the, the, um, the neurons are firing at constant rates, and just fluctuations occur because those rates are being extracted by, from spikes. So these principal components, again, plotted over 100 seconds now, are just wiggling around uh, because of this uh, irregular spiking. I'm also going to show plots like this, so just to get you used to it, where instead of plotting a principal component, which again is just a linear combination of the firing rates I've extracted from this model, uh, over time I plot them against each other here and you get these, you know, noisy sort of orbits. Uh, and this is all just to say, this is just noise, this is not interesting. I'm just setting up for the future. All right, so how do we get this network to do something interesting? And here is, you know, I'm reacting to a frustration, I guess, that I forgot to mention before, that typically if you take these firing rate networks that we build, which are more abstract, we're very good at making them do what we want them to do. We have analytic tools, we have learning rules, we have all sorts of things. We have a, a pretty good understanding of those networks. On the other hand, when you come to a spiking model and you try to get it to do something, it's, it's much more frustrating and much more difficult. So what I'm talking about is an attempt to, to put these together, and in part, it answers the question I began the talk with, but in, in another way, it helps us to use our tools uh, from one domain to the other. And, and I think this extends experimentally in the sense that your analysis of firing is how do you link that back to the spikes in the biophysics. Okay, so the way we're going to get this thing to do something interesting is to add what's called low rank connectivity. So we have random connectivity. We're not going to throw that away. We're just going to leave it, but we're going to add some more synapses. And those synapses are not going to be random. They're going to be structured in a particular way. So let me tell you what low rank connectivity means. Here's a very simple little circuit. There's three neurons connected to three other neurons, and at least in principle, you could have nine total synapses in that, in that situation. Uh, from all the different possible uh, pairings. Now you might say, okay, in general then, the nine synapses are going to have nine strengths associated with them. And I'm, I'm including zero as a possible strength, namely the synapse just not there. So each one of these would be associated with a strength. That's the general case. And when I do the random connectivity, that's exactly what I was doing. I would just choose random numbers for these connections. Some are strong, some are weak, etc. Now, the low rank case is a different case. That's not true. There are not nine free parameters here in the, in the, in the low rank case. And that's because you can think of it as the following uh, sort of uh, situation. Think of it as if each of these presynaptic neurons has a number associated with it, which is going to be determine the strength of all its synapses. Not, not completely, but it's going to be a factor. If you, if you want a biophysical interpretation, you could say this is sort of the release probability of the number of vesicles released, something like that. And in this, this low rank case, that's identical for all the synapses coming out of this one. So this is an inherently presynaptically strong neuron. This is an inherently presynaptically weak neuron. 
and, and we have this restriction. I'm not going to tell you where this restriction comes from, but mathematically, that's what we're talking about. Similarly, on the postsynaptic side, you have a factor associated with the cell, not with each synapse. So this neuron would be a, a neuron that has postsynaptically strong synapses. All its synapses, for example, uh, express a lot of receptors, at least as far as these connections are, are concerned. It doesn't have to be for all of its connections. And again, this is an intrinsically weak uh, postsynaptic cell. And then the synaptic strength is given as the product of these two factors. Now what that means in this simple example is you have three parameters here, three parameters here. So now you really have only six parameters determining the synaptic strengths. It, it, the neuro, there, there are factors associated with neurons, not individual synapses. That's what we mean by low rank. In fact, this is what's called rank one. Okay, so, so I'm going to put this crazy restriction on the synapses. Uh, you'll see why in a little bit. Um, in fact, you'll see why now. So physiologically, we just have, for some reason, some of the synapses in the circuit I'm about to discuss have this property of being governed by a pre- and a postsynaptic factor and being constrained in this per particular way. That's the structure I'm going to impose on this network. Now, mathematically, this, which I, I think of as the physiological interpretation of what I'm doing, is equivalent to this. Now, what does this mean? This means that I've put in a hypothetical unit here. This unit does not exist, okay? It's not, a, it's not a biophysical quantity. It's just a mathematical entity. What I do is I take the spikes coming from these presynaptic neurons, I send them through synapses proportional in strength to these factors, and I sum them up here and, and get a current, a, po a, a postsynaptic current. And then this hypothetical unit just delivers that current onto these postsynaptic cells through these postsynaptic strength things. So mathematically, this circuit here is, is this circuit here. And I'm going to talk about my models in this language. But please don't, don't assume that there's some hypothetical weird theorist neuron in the middle of these circuits. It's really just this. Uh, but it, it, it will turn out to be very useful. And the reason it'll be useful is because there's a quantity we've introduced here. And, and I want to say this quantity is it's not it's not something you know bird can go out and measure particularly easily but it's something you could measure right it's it's part it's a, a quantity associated with the synaptic connectivity of this circuit um, and it's going to be the x variable actually the product the result of this sum is a variable that that's intrinsic to the circuit it's extremely well hidden um, and uh, let me say that if this is at all right it's not my fault that it's well hidden Blame, uh, you know, God or something. Uh, it's very well hidden, but in this construction, there is a variable hidden. Uh, and that variable, I'm going to argue, is, is the key to everything, actually. OK, so how do we do this? We take our, uh, the, the, the random network that I showed you and add one of these low rank connectivities. And this, again, this little picture is just saying, I'm adding some synapses here, but I'm restricting them in this funny way. Okay? And in fact, it, the first model I'm showing you, I'm going to do it twice. So it's what's called rank two. I have two sets of these restricted synapses. And uh, you know, for the theorists in the audience, uh, uh, these are constructed in the following way. In order to construct these synapses, you, you introduce some uh, randomly chosen orthogonal vectors, two of them. One is called W1, and one is called W2. Uh, they, they live in the space of the neurons. And, and you know, we have deviously decided to introduce this rank one perturbation in the following form. You'll see why in a second. If you, if you don't like the mathematics, don't worry. Uh, OK, so when you do this and you, and you adjust the parameters correctly, uh, what you see is, is a, a, a spike raster like this, which looks kind of bursty. You know, it's not easy to interpret. But if you look at the individual neuron, what you see is it's periodic. Okay, it's oscillating. So I'm, basically all I've done is built an oscillator, nothing particularly exciting. You can see that it's still getting this random noisy input. Not, it's random in the sense that the synapses are random, so the random synapses are still there. The spikes are irregular. Uh, they vary from burst to burst, but, the, but there's now something happening here. And it's happening on a slow time scale. This is 10 seconds, so there's some slow processing here. And if you look at these x variables, uh, sure enough, this is the way we designed it. We, you've made a sine and a cosine, basically. You've, you've made the two phases of a, of a harmonic oscillator. If you look at the power spectrum, there it is, oscillating at about a quarter of a hertz. OK. Um, now, 
The only thing I would say, are, should we supposed to get excited at this point? Don't get too excited, you know, stay in your seats, please. Um, but, but there is an interesting fact here, and that is that you can make quite slow oscillations here. This is a tenth of a hertz oscillation, despite the fact that the slowest time scale that I've got in this model is 100 milliseconds. And, and it, sometimes they do this, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there are sort of slow NMDA type synapses with 100 milliseconds, sometimes not. The firing rates are going to be filtered at 100 milliseconds. So anyway, that's the biggest time constant. So these, these things are not arising from any dynamics that you put into the model directly, but rather from the dynamics imposed by this synaptic structure. All right, um, and I, I should mention people like uh, Hakim and, and Brunel have built oscillators like this from spiking models, but, but it was always that the, these time scales determined their frequency, whereas this frequency has been, has been decoupled from those time scales. <laughs> now, I mentioned experimentalists is not going to go out and measure those X variables uh, any day soon. But of course, you can measure the firing rates of the spiking neurons. And, and do one of these PCA analysis, and you see right, right away that this is a different beast than the network I started with. If you look at the percent variances, again, I'm going to do principal component analysis, they're now not uniform like that, but there are modes that stick out, basically three modes that, that stick out. Um, and if you look at the principal component analysis, okay, big surprise, you find the oscillations. Uh, there's the, the, the dominant oscillation, there's a harmonic, this is another harmonic, and if you plot them against each other, you know, you get these nice orbits. So indeed, we've built an oscillator, and this is only to show you that experimentally you could go and measure the spikes and you could, you could figure out that it was an oscillator. This is a very simple example. Now, you might have said, uh, okay, well, but you put in this weird connectivity. Wouldn't it be easy for, you know, someone like Bertu, who just gave a beautiful talk about this connectivity, uh, to go and say, you know, you're right or you're wrong. There's, there's either low rank stuff or there isn't. Here's a picture of the low rank connectivity matrix. So this is a case where there were 1,000 neurons in this network. So this is a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix. Uh, Bert, I should mention, you know, I could do this with uh, two lines of code or something. So if you want, where'd Bert go? If you want to become a theorist, it's a little faster to obtain these than, than what you were talking about. <laughs> you what? I'll come next week. Yeah, OK. <laughs> But, but just in case uh, I, you think Bert is going to have an easy job showing me that I'm wrong, for example, you can see here that you know, this, this sort of checkerboard thing is the structure that I put in. It's a very strong structure. You would say, you know, how could anybody miss this if they measured the connections? But this is only the low rank piece. Of course, what a, 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 an anatomist is going to measure is the full connectivity matrix, and that looks like this. It's completely lost within this random stuff. So this is kind of a, a warning sign to the connectome. As far as functionally, this thing, this mess, is a highly structured network that makes a harmonic oscillator, right? But it's not so easy to see that in this diagram, even when, as a theorist, you can measure every synapse to whatever accuracy you want. OK, back to work. Hopefully, we make something more interesting than a harmonic oscillator. Not, not, it's going to come. So one thing you can do is start adding more of these. So we've gone from rank 2 to rank 4, and, and we're going to choose these pairs again to be oscillators, but now with different frequencies. And just quickly, you see, OK, you can do it. It's, it's not trivial that you do it. Uh, you can get x variables. There are now four of them, and they oscillate at two different frequencies. This isn't really a sine wave. I mean, this is a nonlinear model, so these modes interfere with each other. But here you have you know, the two modes. Uh, you've made two of them. Um, <clears throat> you can make six, uh, six of these x variables, rank six. Again, you make the first two one oscillator, another oscillator, another oscillator, um, and uh, you can you know, kind of get three. It's a little wimpy here. Uh, in other words, we have these three oscillations occurring at the same time. But the reason we're doing this is not to make oscillators. I'm not a particular fan of, of high precision spike timing, and I'm not a particular fan of oscillations either. So this was not the goal. The goal is to break this. Uh, what you can see is you, as you add more and more oscillators, the system has kind of trouble. You notice these are getting further and further from looking like sine and cosine waves. That's because it's a nonlinear system, and nonlinear systems do not like to be quasi-periodic. They don't like to make simultaneously many oscillations, because those oscillations start to mix with each other. And, and if you know dynamical systems, this is a road to getting chaotic activity. Uh, you just 
add oscillators till the system can't deal with it and, and becomes chaotic. So that's the path we're trying to take, but I want to take one little more detour uh, before I get there. So here's going to be a case where the, the added matrix is rank 50. In other words, there are 50 of these uh, little funny loops, 50 of these variables, um, and uh, before I, I'm, I'm going to get it to be chaotic, I want to do one more organized thing. But we're starting to get, you know, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of parameters here, not, not so many, I'll talk about that in a second. And so uh, we've used a second method for determining exactly what rank uh, 50, in this case, uh, perturbation we want to make on these, on these connections. And, and it goes like this. So in general, the, the connections matrix that I'm adding to the random piece looks like this. This is the connection from neuron J in here to neuron I in here. Uh, it looks like this. Again, I'm introducing these uh, random vectors that are orthogonal. So in this case, they're going to be 50 orthogonal vectors that live in the space of neurons. And then I'm going to connect them with another matrix that really determines the form of this rank one perturbation. So in other words, what, what I've done is taken a case where, let's say this is a thousand neurons, so there are a million potential synapses. So there would be a million parameters that you could fiddle if you wanted to make this circuit do something. And you'll see I'm about to make it do something. Um, I've reduced that tremendously because I'm only going to fiddle with this matrix, which lives in the X space. So this is a 50 by 50 matrix. Instead of here, you have a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, huge reduction in variables. And I, I hope you can see that what I've done is I've gone from playing with a spiking network to playing with what's essentially a rate network. It has smaller number of the variables. These are continuous variables. These are spiking units. And now I can use all of the tricks we know uh, from rate networks when we were dealing with continuous variables uh, to adjust this. And in particular, I'm going to use uh, 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 something called force learning that David Cicillo and I developed. But you can use all sorts of tricks to try to adjust this small matrix so this network does something you want it to do. Okay? And, and in, I'll just show you a quick example. Here, here is the, the, uh, the, the network doing something. You really can't tell what it's doing. But if I look at these x variables, uh, what you see, if you can see it at any rate, is this is a, a, a moving uh, bump of activity. This is reproducing one of the models I cited Heim for uh, in my slide a while ago, which is uh, what's called the ring model. This is a, a moving version of the ring model. Anyway, you can get this system to do something. This is, it, it, the experimentalists are probably saying, big deal, but uh, OK, big deal, but I'm proud of myself. OK, uh, all right, so let me do the other thing, though, with this, with this system. I'm doing well on time. OK, um, which is, again, I'm going to add a bunch of these. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the trick um, of, of the forced learning, and I'm going to try to make them oscillators. So in other words, I'm going to try to make something between 20 and 50 oscillators with just random chosen frequencies, and I'm going to fail. And the reason is, again, a nonlinear system, you try to, to make it have, it have it do 50 different oscillations at different non-commensurate frequencies, it doesn't want to do that. It, it'll go chaotic. And, and that's what happens, uh, I think. Okay, I, I should mention this is all preliminary. One question from Heim and, poof, you know, it all goes down the drain. I mean, the students, you can relate to that, right? Uh, okay, so um, here's 10 seconds of activity. Again, these are the x variables. So this is the analog of the rate variables. I, I, I want to say that these really have a biophysical significance. In the model, I know exactly what they are and how they relate to the spikes. Uh, they're not easy to measure. They're easy to measure in a model. And you can see they're just wiggling like crazy. There are 50 wiggles here. Uh, and and um, if you do the power spectrum, you don't get these frequency spikes like before. You get a continuous spectrum with lots of power at low frequencies, really low frequencies, below 1 hertz. So this is generating rate fluctuations, right? Uh, the, the spiking fluctuations are at much higher frequency, right? It, you've, you've generated the low frequency stuff that at the beginning in these double slit stochastic models would be associated with the, the rate fluctuations. Now, uh, here's what the activity of these things look like. It's kind of bursty. Honestly, uh, I think this is a bit of the fact that we really haven't played with the parameters enough yet. Um, so I, wouldn't, I don't want to say that their burstiness is, is really a prediction of this. It's just the way they're working at the moment. Uh, okay, uh, but, but you can again do one of these principal component analyses 
And what you get is an exponentially falling uh, um, variance distribution. So, you know, the first principal component in this case is about 9%, and then this falls away. Um, if you look at the principal components, they look highly irregular. They kind of look like this, this chaotic, uh, um, these chaotic rate networks. If you plot them against each other, you, you get a mess. This is supposed to be a mess. Now, you might have said, well, wait a minute, you've got a mess when you started the talk, uh, and, and you've gone from mess to mess. Is this an achievement? Um, you, what you should look at is the magnitude here. So what I showed you at the beginning was constant rates being fluctuated by the spikes. Here, I have rates that are really fluctuating. If you notice the scale here, it's in the thousands. If I go back to the slide I showed you before, the scale here is, you know, in order of one. This is, these are fluctuations a thousand times bigger in the rates than what I showed you before. And, and you know, they have partial structure. They're, they're not completely isotropic like these guys. Uh, okay. Uh, just for fun, here are uh, extracted from one of these things, principal component one, principal component two, principal component 50, and Haim might recognize why I'm doing this, um, because this is from work that Haim and I did with a, a graduate student, Kanaka Rajan, where we took a firing rate model that was chaotic and we extracted uh, these components, and I, you know, I think you can see they kind of look the same. So this is my proof of, of a chaotic, chaotic network. All right, so I want to finish this section and, and talk about Mirab's work a little bit, but, but I want to stress so it's sort of a philosophical viewpoint. Reality is we have a spiking network. And you can argue with the biophysical detail, but, but you know, I, I would say we've, we've captured the essence of spiking neurons here. And, and we, can, we can make this as biophysical as even Bert would want. Um, we've added to it a very particular synaptic connectivity. Whether this connectivity exists or not, of course, is an experimental question. Uh, but this is a hypothesis that this exists. And in the process, um, of course, you know, in this viewpoint, these are the neurons and, and, uh, and these are the connections, okay? So these, these variables, I got ahead of myself a second. Uh, the, these spiking things are, are the neurons and those are the real neurons. And, and these variables and all this is really just a statement of a hypothesis about synaptic connectivity. Now, of course, out pops from this, these variables that kind of look like a rate model. Uh, you could say, well, these, these just look like exactly the variables. And I showed you this picture where they look, they really do look like a rate model. And so you could sort of say, well, maybe what you've really built is a rate network. But, but if you did that, then what happens? These two flip, right? The, the rate network, you would call these the neurons and these the connections. It's, it's dual. And that's what I want to stress, that this picture is dual. Most rate models, you say, well, the rate I'm talking about would be the firing rate of that neuron. And I'm, I'm arguing no. You're really talking about a feature of the synaptic connectivity when you build a rate model. Now, of course, reality is this. And, and I would just argue these are just useful variables for building these models, for figuring out what synaptic connections you need to, to make a certain function, um, to understand what's going on. As I say, these kinds of variables, experimentalists use them just as much as theorists. I, 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 this is not a completely theorist construction. Um, and I would argue that they are variables associated with the connectivity, not, not strictly with the activity of the neurons. Okay, so I, I, I ask you, uh, just summarize this part. What are the biophysical correctly? They're these internal sums from low rank synaptic connectivity, and, and this is a dual description between uh, spikes and, and what was called firing rates, but are re really connection variables. Do we have a doubly chaotic uh, model? Maybe. I, I don't really know yet. Okay, so let me go on to the next part. I have a little time to do this. I think I can fit it in, uh, which is this idea of taking these chaotic firing rate networks and, and adding a fixed point. So, so why do you want to do this? Let me, let me go back to, uh, uh, to reality, if you want to call it that. I don't know. You know, suppose you're doing a task like this or an animal's doing a task where you get a go cue, you're supposed to reach to the right level or something like that, you know? And, and uh, you're in a certain state because you've been instructed to keep doing that every trial, right? So you, you have a state that exists over a, a long period of time and you keep doing go right, go right, go right. But then maybe you get a cue or you change your mind, I don't know, and you go into another state and that state is associated with saying, no, I'm going to hit the left button when I get the go cue, right? And then you, you persist in that state for a while. So this is typical. So what I would argue is if we want to model something like this, we would reuse these rate dynamics. The spiking dynamics is not what makes you reach to the right or to the left. 
It's this rate dynamics. So we would use the kind of models I'm talking about, and you know, maybe we could build a model in which would generate from the go queue a rightward reach, and from the go queue a leftward reach. But we'd have to really do something different down here to sustain over many minutes. You, know? you might be doing a task for half an hour and then be told to switch. Um, and this is this fixed point structure that, that uh, I, I talked about uh, way back, where, where you have networks that just sit in states for long periods of time and, and keep you in that state. And, and through feed, feed, you know, feed through from here to here, tell the rate dynamics, you know, you're doing the right reach. Now do the left reach. So that's the idea here of, of uh, what Marav is working on. So how do you do this? You take one of these rate model networks, okay? And uh, so, so again, these are these X variables and R variables uh, where you have these connections. And, and what Marav has looked at is a case where you put in quite strong connectivity, self-connectivity. Now, the key is that th these are not neurons. You might say, well, what, you're putting in some gigantic RTAPs on every neuron? No, that's not what's happening because these are not neurons. As I mentioned, these are collective variables of the, the units. So probably the most biophysical interpretation is that, that these are sort of clusters of neurons that are quite strongly coupled to each other, but in addition connect uh, to, to, to their neighbors. And so the kind of uh, structure that Bert was talking about sort of fits within this, in which, which is within one barrel column. Uh, you have strong interconnections among those neurons, but then they also connect across to the neighboring columns. It's a structure like that. Okay, now there are going to be two relevant variables here. There's the strength of the connections, the, the, the distal connections, and they're called G, and then the connection, the self-connections, the strength of these local connections, that's called S. All right, so the model looks like this for the theorists. Uh, this is the novel term. This is a standard random model. These are going to be random connections. Uh, and, and here's the additional connections. And the activity looks something like this. So let's start off with S equals 0. This is a model I referred to a paper of Heim's uh, from a long time ago that Heim worked out in great detail with collaborators what happens in this case as a function of the strength of the, these are what we would call the long range interactions. And what happens is below a strength of 1, you just get decaying activity to 0. Nothing happens. It's a, sort of a dead network. And then at 1, uh, it comes to life and makes these chaotic rate fluctuations that I have been talking about uh, previously. So Marav's job is to figure out what happens when you change the S, using really the same methods that Heim used uh, many years ago to study the other case. Um, so if you make S negative, what happens is you, you kind of suppress the chaos. So now you can get cases where you get fairly strong uh, distal coupling and you still get this decay to zero, but eventually it comes to life and, and is chaotic. So you suppress chaos. Uh, you won't be surprised then that when you make S positive, you sort of enhance the chaos. You can now get it for weaker coupling here. But I think you can start to see here a little bit uh, a sort of a bistability, uh, this sort of fixed point structure entering in. Right? This, this sort of <coughs> random wiggles is a little different than here where you see these, these, uh, these activities. And these are just the, the, either the x variables or the r variables, it doesn't really matter, um, associated with these units. Um, they, they tend to go to these extreme limits. And you'll see later that if we increase the s, well now, uh, if you increase the s variable a little bit, uh, you start to get into a bistable regime. These are the fixed points I'm talking about. There are a large number of them. And, and these would represent the states uh, that, that the system lies in. And you can get situations like this. This is a transient one, but that's OK, um, where, where you have a mixture of the dynamics and the fixed point. And so you have dynamics that occurs for a while here. You see, eventually it goes away. But dynamics that occurs for a while inside of a state. That, this is what we're trying to shoot for here. OK, so uh, Marav has worked out the whole phase diagram looks kind of like this. Maybe I'll summarize it better here um, by uh, saying there are different regions. There's a region where this network is boring over here. This is this long range variable, short range variable. There's a region which you get chaos, and there's a region which you get fixed points. And, and we can now interpolate between these two classes of models. Um, the chaos normally has variables that just oscillate around with a, a, a 
monophasic distribution, but as you push up to this limit, you start to see the mixture of fixed point and chaos in these bimodal distributions of this thing. Another interesting feature, I'm gonna have to rush a little bit to get done, um, is that as you cross this line, you might say, well, that means the system's just gonna go dead. It's gonna be chaotic and now and lock up to a dynamically dead, I mean, to a fixed point. That's not really true. It takes a long time to get to the fixed point uh, and it grew, that time grows exponentially with the network size. So if you're down here, in particular, it can take a long time to get there, so you can get these transient states where you have both the dynamics and the fixed point structure kind of superimposed. And uh, this is just showing as you move up, that lifetime gets reduced. All right, I, I wanted to say one thing about this progression then before I close, and, and I'll take some questions. So, you know, we have these three uh, eras in the, in the evolution of, of neuroscience here, I would say. And I tried to think of, you know, what's an image that, for me at least, you know, captures what's going on here, and it's this image. It's the image of an open door, an, a, a door that's open for all of us. Let me go back to the, to the prehistoric era. This door was my door, really. Um, the work that Danny Amit and Hannah Gutfreund and Heim Sampolinsky did in these days that Hanuk was remembering a few days ago, um, this opened the door for me. I, I, just very literally, I'm, I'm here giving this talk because I opened that door. I, I would be giving a talk maybe in the physics building about particle physics uh, if they hadn't opened that door. So that was the door for me. And then, uh, you know, with the intelligence of, of uh, the whole group, uh, starting the ICNC made that door open for, for many, many students who, who have walked through that door and, and, and gained tremendously from it. And now in LSAC, I think uh, the door is opening to young researchers. There's hiring of, of young researchers. There are going to be facilities for them. Uh, and, and it goes through the door. And, and uh, I'm very grateful. I think we should all be grateful for the door. I'll just end with one little comment, uh, maybe for the young people, but it doesn't hurt for all of us to remind, uh, remind ourselves. This door, this figurative door that has been opened you know, by LSAC and, and people here um, is different than this physical door in, in one important way. When you go through this physical door, what happens, you get to see what's on the other side. But the door that we're talking about, when you go through, you get to create what's on the other side. And, and I, I wish you all the luck in creating that. Thank you. Thank you, Larry, for the talk. And I can't resist but making the comment on my side. If uh, ICNC was not created by the people who created it, I would be on the other side of the door, not knowing about this side of the door. So the two of us came yeah. into a new reality. <laughs> and thank you very much also for showing us together, Bert and Larry, how much we can connect because I don't know if accidentally or not, your talks were related <laughs> to each other in a very uh, exciting way. Questions? Uh, Heim, see? Of course, Heim. Here, here yeah. goes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm still shocked. <laughs> uh, in the, the X-network, uh, did you try or, uh, to actually check whether it was chaotic or was random? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's why I said the maybe. No, it's, this, is very, this is a very new work. So I, I don't guarantee it's chaotic. Uh, yeah. it, you know, it could be quasi-periodic, for example, but I don't think so. But and if you look at the, at the spectrum uh, of the spike, you see, you see two, two, two spectra or bimodal, uh, you know, the, the spike fluctuation and the rate fluctuation. That's yeah. Obvious in the spectrum. Yeah, so, so I've only done it on the rates, and there, there you've gotten rid of that. I think so. I don't know. Again, it's too premature. I don't know the answer. Yali? So, Larry, in the first part, the matrix is shown, the connectivity matrix of a fixed point and chaos. If, the, if, the, if a big W is the one that, is, is, is that the Hopkins monologue on these, on these like spikes? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> theory to help you understand. Exactly. That's exactly the idea. That you would, that, that would be like in these rate networks, Hopfield networks, whatever, that's the matrix that we all know about. So you could build it like, like Hopfield did, you could build it like we did, exactly. So you can use that intuition. You got it, exa you got it exactly. Only?
Yes, I mean, yeah. no, that's an excellent suggestion that by using the activity, we should, we should actually do an example like, that's a great idea. I, you know, Omri was in our center at Columbia, and he would always do this in the talks. Um, Merav <laughs> called him the source of all good ideas. That was his nickname. Um, and now you have him in Israel, although not here. Uh, and uh, anyway, it's a very good suggestion. I don't mean to embarrass you, but it's a very good suggestion because we could do that in the model. Say if we, if we knew the activity, we know what it's doing. For example, you know it's an oscillator. Can you then dig it out? That's a wonderful suggestion. No, sorry, in a fixed point, you get constant rates. Okay. But constant rates that, that can be in many different configurations. So in one case, you know, this network's high, neuron's high, in other case, it looks like this. Okay. So I have an in in inevitable question following the, the day of hierarchy distribution. Do you think the X is really the last part of the day? Does it go on? Yeah, no, and in a sense, this extension, uh, the Marav to fixed point was one more hierarchy. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned it that way. So, of course, it's a huge hierarchy, and, and but, you know, this is the ability to go to three hierarchies. And I mentioned, you know, coming out of Heim and, and others from here, you have the building blocks of these hierarchies. And, you know, the attempt is to link those, but extend them beyond. I mean, you know, we have a lifetime of hierarchies. So. I, I, it's, that's right. And then sort of what are the X variables of cognition is, that's your question. That's, uh, you, you know the answer. Yeah, so. Uh, a different way of looking at things or something that's compatible with you? No, you know, when I started, I, I was talking about this process. You start with the spikes, you, you take the rates, you do PCA. You know, his was really that pathway. And, and what he did knew, I guess you could say, was take a principal component analysis and then go one step further. And, and the idea is principal component analysis just tells you about variance. It doesn't tell you about the variance you're necessarily interested in. It just says here's a lot of variance. There are a whole bunch of people, Mark being one and, and John Cunningham, but a lot of people uh, have tried to say, can we do something to PCA which, which gives it a cue about what we want? You know, what are we looking for? What's interesting? And so uh, you can do you know, linear combinations of the PCA that are most informative about the particular variable you're interested in. That, that there's a whole program for that that I think is incredibly important because we need to not just know about variance, but the variance that's associated with the task or with the stimulus or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, I, is, is it a problem that, in fact, neurons are rarely in Poisson, that by themselves their variance is much higher than Poisson, and what activation does, either of a surround, at least in mm -hmm. the primal cortex, either activation of the surround or activation of the center will drive it towards Poisson. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so, so that, that, that I, I, I mean, you've said very clearly what I didn't say clearly. The reason it's super Poisson is because, you know, the view would be here, is that you have this random spike link and you also have the rate fluctuations. So when you're in an uncontrolled situation, your firing rates are fluctuating, you're thinking of things, I don't know why. Um, and so the total variability is the, is the sum of those two things and it's going to be super Poisson. But then when you lock onto a task, from trial to trial, the rate part is much more constrained because you're doing the task. And so it drops to the Poisson part that is not controlled by the task. So th this, th this captures that actually quite nicely. If you go to, the, to these oscillator models and, and you, know, you, 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 <coughs> did, you did the same oscillation on every trial, that variability would go away and you would definitely drop. We, we Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's another class of connectivity. I think, I think it's, you, sh you should do it. It's a good idea because, um, you know, the idea we start with random connectivity because we don't know what we're doing uh, and, then, and then put in. And, and ideally, you know, Bert gave a beautiful talk here. Ideally, we want this to, to join. Um, it's hard because uh, it's just hard. But, but, you know, maybe random worlds is a better model than low rank. I, low rank is, is my idea of the day, but uh, I think that you should try it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.